welcome to our webinar today, Making the Most of Your Evaluation, How to Use Evaluation Findings to Benefit Your Project. We're so excited to have you here today. Before we get started, as a few reminders, you will be in listen-only mode for this live webinar. To ensure you hear presenters clearly through the speakers or headphones, please make sure you check your audio. If you need to adjust those, you can use the audio settings, the gear setting at the top of your screen. Uh, before we get started, we do want to give a short preview of our new platform here in case you are new to it, Demio. Uh, first, uh, you'll see on your top right hand corner, there's a few tabs that access different features throughout the webinar. And these features um, will appear when we go ahead and post something. So right now you shouldn't see your polls and handout, but they will appear once we go ahead and post a poll or handout. To go ahead and chat with us, you can enter the chat in the bottom right hand corner there. For the polls, they will launch in the polls panel and that should pull up for you when we launch our first poll. But if it does not, you can simply just click on that tab at the top of your screen that says polls and you'll be able to interact with the poll feature. There you go, you can interact there. <laughs> And then we also will have a handout tab that will appear later on in the session. We will be able to download our handout from this session as well. And again, those won't appear until we go ahead and launch those. So don't worry if you can't see them just yet. If you do have any technical issues throughout this webinar, we encourage you to reach out to Anna Kunzel. You can reach her by using at Anna in the chat box. So with that, we want to go ahead and kick off our webinar. Again, welcome to Making the Most of Your Evaluation, How to Use Evaluation Findings to Benefit Your Project. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate. Evaluation, Evaluate is the evaluation resource, sorry, evaluation research and learning hub. And you can learn more about us on our website. The materials provided today will include slides, which are already uploaded on our website. We'll also have a couple additional handouts that will be listed on the website and provided at the end of this webinar. And then as always, our webinars are recorded and will be available in a few days after this webinar closes. A few introductions before we get started. First, I am Emma Lieberg and I am today's moderator. We also have Michael Harner and Lisa wilson Becho as our presenters for this webinar. We all work at Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Also behind the scenes, we'd like to recognize our colleagues who have worked hard to help bring this webinar to you today. First, a big thank you to Anna Consol, who is providing technical support during today's live event. And thank you to Lori Wingate, Kelly Robertson, and Valerie Marshall for their input on the creation of the webinar content. Additionally, a thank you to Carolyn williams Noren for copy editing our slides and additional materials. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech area like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and so on. You can learn more about the ATE program at the link provided. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. So now I will turn things over to Lisa. Thanks, Emma. Hello, everyone. As Emma said, my name is Lissa wilson Becho, and I'm excited to be here today with Michael Harner to talk with you about how you can make the most of your evaluation. So we're going to start out today's webinar with an introduction to why you should use your evaluation. Then we're going to jump into the nitty gritty of how you can do this. And so we've broken this up into four separate sections. First, using your evaluation for project improvement using your evaluation for dissemination and advocacy, for project accountability, and finally for project planning. So we want you to come away from this webinar with practical steps that you can put into work now. We're also excited to share three stories of using evaluation to benefit projects graciously shared with us from uh, folks from the ATE community. So we'll be in the, we will be interspersing these stories throughout the webinar. We also have two question breaks today. So write any questions or comments that you might have in the chat window to your right at any point throughout the webinar. We're really happy to have Emma and Anna on with, us, on with us today to keep track of those questions. 
All right, so to start off our webinar, we wanna hear from you. So a poll question is going to appear in the panel to the right side of your screen. If it doesn't automatically pop up, you can go ahead and navigate to the panel by clicking the poll tab. So our first question for you today is, what role are you in relation to evaluation? Are you a PI or a co-PI? Are you a member of a project team? Are you an evaluator or are you something else? You can add your other role into the chat window. We have about almost 100 people on with us today. So we're looking at about half of the, the attendance and response so far. So it looks like we have about um, 37 evaluators on with us today and about 10 PIs or project members. That's wonderful. Well, so if you are a project staff, um, you're the main users of evaluation. And a lot of the content that we talk about in today's webinar will be geared directly towards you. But for those of you that are evaluators, we have a lot of good content for you as well. So throughout the webinar, make sure to consider how you as the evaluator might be able to encourage or promote these different types of use. And then you can also share the resources from today's webinar with your PI or your project staff. Same with other roles. So our grant professionals, um, our other roles on board. Let me turn over to the chat. We have a research impact officer, a researchers. Wonderful, welcome. We're so glad you're all here today. So we have one more poll question for you today. So now that we know who is here, we want to hear about your current use of evaluation. So Emma, can we go ahead? There we go. So the second poll should have popped up. So that poll says, to what extent do you feel like your project is currently benefiting from your evaluation? Is it not at all? Is it somewhat? Do you think it's a good deal? Or are you pretty extensively using and benefiting from your evaluations? Or is your project extensively using those evaluations? It looks like about 50% of people are saying that you're currently somewhat betting from your evaluation. So I'm glad that you know, we're at least getting some use out of it. And we hope that you can really uh, come away with some suggestions to increase that. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, we have most people using or thinking that they can use their evaluation a good deal or pretty extensively after this. Well, wonderful. Well, wherever you are, we are glad that you joined us today. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael to get us started today. Thank you so much, Lissa. Let's start this webinar off with a little background and some of our thoughts on why it is important to use your evaluation. Uh, for the purposes of this webinar, our definition of evaluation use is focused on when an evaluation leads to change in the program being evaluated, <clears throat> the host organization, or people involved. And so essentially, that is change across the ecology of your project as a direct result of some evaluation activity or findings. Much of, as Lissa said, much of what we say in this webinar will be applicable to both project staff and their evaluators. And it's really wonderful to see so many evaluators on this webinar with us today. For as an example of evaluation use, consider the possibility that your evaluator gathers data from mentors about how well students in your program are doing with the mentoring experience. Your evaluator tells you that mentors think mentees are not getting the support they need from the industry partners you already have involved in the project. You work to add different or more diverse industry partners, and in the process, you share your needs with your advisory team, and they help you identify new partners. You just used evaluation findings to improve your project. And keep in mind that evaluation use can occur at the very beginning and all the way through reporting, dissemination, and possibly into the next project. Use really is what we hope to happen with an evaluation, but is something you have to attend to. Chris Lysi, one of our evaluation cartoonists, imagines that some evaluators might provide you with a report and choose to host it on some obscure section of a website, and the evaluation is done. How does anybody else really ever see it? This is one of the stories of evaluation use that we like to avoid. That is, not thinking through the evaluation and how it might be disseminated to increase its usefulness. You probably already understand this, but NSF highly values evaluation. They have an entire policy around evaluation and a set of evaluation principles developed in 2016. Researchers, both inside and outside the agency, are expected to adopt the principles so that findings from their work 
will be useful for stakeholders. Evaluation should be uh, should be relevant and have utility. Uh, it should be uh, used, uh, I'm sorry, it should have high quality and rigor, uh, independent and objective, transparent and reproducible, and be based on a strong sense of ethics. The policy begins by stating that all of these principles are in service of usefulness, giving principal investigators and people at the project level information and knowledge when they need it to make good decisions for their project. One glance at these principles, and you can imagine that it might be hard to maximize all of them in a single project. NSF says that researchers are expected to balance decisions judiciously in addressing tensions or conflicts among the principles, if any arise. And it's not just the idea that NSF requires it, and so therefore you should do it. A treasure chest of value can be generated from the project for the project by using your evaluation. I recently spoke to, spoke to the leader of an ATE center who said they had been funded for 15 years by NSF and they knew it was time to sunset, move on, or find alternative support. Their work was consistently recognized by one of their partner organizations and towards the end of their funding, that partner offered to subsume the center, providing long-term sustain sustainability. The po person spoke very clearly about how the evaluation processes and systems that they had put in place led to a continuous conversation around what they were doing, how they, well they were doing it, and who they were serving. In the end, that proved to their partners that they had the potential for great impact and were worth the investment of a partner subsuming them and taking in that center. They were treasured enough to be sustainable. Every year, NSF spends a lot of money on evaluation and there is little evidence of how much project leaders actually use their evaluation. Because of this, we proposed to study evaluation use and in 2018, NSF funded us to develop case studies of evaluation use. Some of the findings from that study are embedded in this webinar. Our goal is to encourage ATE grantees to think about and engage in processes that will lead to more useful evaluation. And I want to briefly share some of uh, what we have learned so far. In a recent survey, we asked project leaders if they made changes to the project in response to their evaluation findings and about their frequency of interaction with their evaluators. 46% of the respondents said they made changes to the implementation of their project as a result of evaluation. Those who did make changes engaged with their evaluator more frequently. This highlights some research on evaluation use that has shown that there is a personal factor. Somebody cares about it and those relationships lead to more evaluation use. Other things we are learning is that most project leaders share their evaluation reports beyond the project, but not extensively. We asked project leaders who they shared their current evaluation results with. And what I want you to focus on in this bar chart is the difference between the teal and gray bars. As you can see at the top, almost every project leader shares their results with executive administrators and other key uh, stakeholders. Notice that as your eyes move down the chart, those who say they did not share their current evaluation results, the teal part of the bar, begins to go up. In fact, at the bottom of the chart, you can see that more project leaders said no to sharing their results with educators or professionals outside the project institution, prospective project partners, and prospective students or parents. These last three are clear opportunities where some are not sharing as much and could point to a place where we can help project leaders improve their use. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as a strategy for serving, for using your evaluation later on in this webinar. So evaluation uh, reports are shared with most key stakeholders, but not all. And then finally, the one thing I want to mention that we've learning is that it, it, it's a little unusual, but not unexpected. Evaluators tend to become useful by their own nature of who they are. So many of the evaluators, so many of the evaluators have worked on other ATE projects and have, and some have been PIs themselves. 
What I'm hearing from some is that evaluators serve an interesting role of something I'm tentatively calling a knowledge broker. For instance, an evaluator will say, you have a really interesting project, and I know this other project or this industry leader who might actually be useful to have involved in this project. And so they serve this extra role of, of uh, bringing things together for the PI. One evaluator I talked to works on multiple different projects in the same state, and so she had a lot of experience the project leadership team found very useful when building out the project. So if you're interested in this research, please get in touch with me offline and we can talk more about it. But now, let's hand it off to Lissa to get us into some specific ways you can use your evaluation. Well, thanks, Michael. Well, now that we have laid the foundation, let's turn to some specific ways that you can use evaluation to benefit your project. While planning this webinar, we realize that we frequently hear the phrase, evaluation should be used, but that's rare, rarely broken down into practical suggestions. So that's what we want to do today. So we have organized our points into four main sections that represent different aspects of a project's life cycle. So first we have project improvement. So evaluation findings can be used for continual improvement of your project throughout your grant. Regularly reflecting on evaluation findings can help fine tune your project activities and even deepen the impact your project is making. Second, project dissemination and advocacy. Evaluation findings can illuminate the lessons that you've learned or promising practices that are coming out of your project and that you can share with others to help advance both your project and the field that you're in. Third, project accountability. Evaluation is required by the National Science Foundation and by many other funders. So with this comes requirements for reporting and accountability around the project's progress and impact. And finally, project planning. So evaluation findings about past work can help plan your next endeavor. So let's start off by looking at how you can use findings from your evaluation for project improvement. So first, use those findings to identify and maximize a project's strengths. Your evaluation may highlight areas of the projects that are working especially well. So take advantage of this insight to boost these aspects or increase that project impact. So for example, this might look like expanding the number of students that served by an activity that was shown to be of high impact. Or maybe it's about increasing the use of a particularly effective module in a professional development training. On the flip side, you can use evaluation findings to assess or address any trouble areas. So participant feedback or other evaluation data might identify a certain aspect of the pro project that might not be working as you intended or that might be experiencing some difficulties. So take advantage of reviewing those evaluation findings with your team to identify which areas of your project are not performing as you had hoped or maybe how your project could make fixes to these issues. Evaluation can also help ensure that projects are reaching their target audience. So for example, if your project is a biotech program, you might be aiming to increase the number of women in your program. So data on who is participating and how frequently they're participating can be compared to the audience that your project intended to serve. Disaggregating your data by characteristics such as race or gender or even enrollment status or discipline can really help reveal whether some of the aspects some people are being served um, more or less than your project intended. Your evaluation might also suggest ways to add or modify industry engagements. So collaboration with industry, uh, uh, business and industry partners is particularly important for advanced technological education programs. So many ATE projects actually integrate their evaluators into their business and industry leadership team or their built meetings. So with this additional insight, evaluation can really help you recognize where there might be a gap in the project that could benefit from more business input, or maybe that there's an industry area that the project's not quite engaging with enough. The evaluation can really help you be more aware of these and make some recommendations of industry areas that the project can reach out to. So before we move on to the next area, we want to hear, we want to pause and hear from you all in a chat question. So again, the chat is located on the right side of your screen, and we want to hear from you in what ways have you used evaluation findings to make improvements in your project? Or if you're an evaluator, what ways have you seen project staff using evaluations to make improvements in their project? So I see that Eldon said that 
the evaluation is helping to identify strategies during the COVID shutdowns. That's such a great point. I've heard of so many evaluations who have really helped identify aspects of projects that are working and are not working as things have gone virtual, as colleges and other areas have shut down due to COVID. Rebecca said that um, she, the evaluation res improved response rates on the next participant surveys. That's great. And then Jessica said that they used evaluation to develop evaluation to develop capacity building projects for our grantees. That's so wonderful. You know, I'm glad that everyone is already exploring different ways to use evaluation for project improvement. I'll read a couple more that, that are coming in. Let's see, I see Michael says that the results of professional development workshop surveys have been used to refine and better target future workshop offerings. That's such a great example of looking at the evaluation findings and really improving them in the immediate future for your next workshop. And then Bob mentioned that he engages industry and in program assessment and improvement, which is so wonderful for ATE audiences. And then to target student recruitment strategies, also another really important one. We hear projects talking about a lot about recruitment strategies of students, particularly historically underserved students. And so projects can really share best practices across the similar projects of similar um, student populations by sharing their evaluation findings. This is all really wonderful. Thank you all for, for sharing in the chat. I hope you continue to do so throughout the webinar. So before we move on to the next part, so we asked a few people to share stories about how they are using evaluations for project improvement. So the first of these three stories we have for you today comes from Sandra LeRae. So Sandra is an ATE evaluator who works at the National Institute for STEM Evaluation and Research at the University of Tennessee. And she tells us about how her evaluation helped to improve an online platform that the project was not quite using to its fullest extent. So let's hear her experience. My name is Sandra Ray, and I work at the National Institute for STEM Evaluation and Research at the University of Tennessee. And I'm currently evaluating two NSF ATE projects. So uh, one story of uh, a change that happened with an evaluation project is one where I was working with a faculty from different institutions and they had created an online platform for students and faculty to use to discuss information related to the grant to share ideas and curriculum products and so in the course of our regular monthly evaluation meetings um, i noticed that we were communicating in a different way we were using a, a google doc but i knew that the online platform had an embedded um, discussion board and meeting platform. And so I asked them about it and they said, well, it's really hard to use and our students aren't using it either. And so then um, I sort of directed them in the cha channel of thinking about user experience. And so how, if it's difficult for you to use and at the same time you're noticing students and teachers aren't using it, let's look at the platform. So that was a change that we had to make in the evaluation, but it was also a change we had to make in terms of thinking about the evaluation budget. So user experience was not something that, it was something that I could work with an external person to do and gather information from, but it was not something I had the background in. So we ended up making a change to how we looked at the program budget and adding in a piece about user experience and me collaborating with their um, external evaluation of that piece and giving feedback to the stakeholders, the major stakeholders. And so it resulted in them changing the platform and us being able to report to NSF that we made changes to improve the user experience. I continued with the project. I infused some of those changes into my survey with students and my focus groups with students. And I asked them specifically about, well, what are you using the website for now? And how is that different than your experience before. And then it talked, it, it spoke to making those iterative changes. It spoke to making modifications to the project along the way. And that project ended up going after some additional funding and um, getting another proposal to build out that website in a continued more usable way. And when we did that, we built in a very intentional piece for user experience. So we could continue to engage 
that external feedback all of the time. Um, and it enabled me to find out from the students, before we even got to that change, I gathered information about what the students might need in terms of like the use of the website and being able to interact with materials and what faculty needed in order for them to be able to share their curriculum. That was the goal of the website. And then even now, as the pandemic happened in, in the spring, that meant for heavier reliance on the website. And because we had some of this real-time evaluation data from the first round of funding and additional data from um, you know, the user experience, we were able to make, I think, faster changes to the website than we would have without that evaluation piece in the first place. In fact, they used, they said, you know, you're kind of holding a mirror up to us, which is my goal in evaluation. When I first brought it up to them, I said, you know, how come we're not meeting using the platform? And they said, oh, it's really hard to use. And I said, well, maybe that's something we should be exploring is, you know, and so then once we started meeting regularly and noticing our changes and bringing in that user experience, then that meant that they were more mindful of the tools they were asking uh, the students and teachers to use. So it was good real-time changing data. You want to design something that people can use. Wonderful. So I, I want to call attention to how the evaluation findings really helped the project that Sandra evaluated to increase the effectiveness of their online platform and how the evaluation helped the project to make changes at a faster pace given that shift to virtual communication in the time of COVID like we had mentioned before. I also, I really love when Sandra says that evaluation holds a mirror up to the project. Such a great analogy for how evaluation benefits the project. Wonderful. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael for our next section. So I really enjoy talking about this section because I spent my early years of my adult life telling stories for television audiences. So t storytelling and dissemination and advocacy feels like getting your story out there to bolster your support and your political capital. And so the first one I would say is that sharing your lessons from your evaluation with other projects that have similar outcomes is a great way to spread the wealth. For instance, meeting people at conferences is a great opportunity to share lessons. I know this is harder with the new virtual conference model, uh, you know, impressed upon us by COVID, but most still offer opportunities for participants to network and have offline, quote unquote, conversations in sidebars. These conferences are attended by people in your arena, and it is a great way to start networking and find out who's doing what and share what you're learning. If you're not sure what conferences are available in your area, your program manager will likely have recommendations. So look for those opportunities to share your lessons and successes. <clears throat> Many leaders at our own institutions have no idea what we're doing. If you can make opportunities to share your project achievements, uh, your experiences, your outcomes, what you are doing well for the school, you can raise the profile for your project and get the information out there and in a profitable way. <clears throat> There are a lot of different partners out there and a lot of different ways that you can communicate with them. The more they understand what it is you're doing, the more likely they are to buy into it. That's one of the theories behind creating more evaluation use. Get them involved, keep them informed, and they'll be more likely to stay engaged. And then finally for this section, I would say that that also goes for those whom you might be serving, that is the participants themselves. How many of you actually are telling your students or prospective students that you're walking the walk and not just talking the talk of continuous learning? By showing the kind of findings that you're learning and how you're improving your own effort, it shows them that they're in a system of learning, of constant improvement and continuous learning. Now that we've given you a few more examples of how evaluation might be put to use, we'd like to hear a little bit more from you. We're going to use the chat function again, and let's have you answer the question on the screen. <clears throat> How do you, or who do you share your evaluation findings with and why? And I will be over here in the chat looking to see what uh, we've got. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see, where do I see? Mm -hmm. Advisors. Ah, yes, Jessica says that she shares them with executive team and the funders, which is a great way to keep people informed about the project. <clears throat> Uh, and Alyssa shares with us, of course, that my, cli my clients tend to share their evaluation findings with their participants, which is fantastic. So often, not necessarily a group we've seen shared with, as you saw from the, the data that we've got so far. And Wendy says that she shares it with program staff, PIs, and NSF. And then Rebecca also says that program participants, to keep them engaged, to maintain a dialogue. Oh, I like this one. Uh, Tendeka says that grantors in order to be in a better position to receive continued funding, I also share them with students. Goodness gracious, we've got a lot of people sharing with them, lots of different audiences, which is really fantastic. Bob says, part of the initial process is identifying all the stakeholders. Then I encourage the PI to share some form of findings with all stakeholders. Fantastic. And Nancy, other similar programs so they can learn from us and start a communication for future sharing to help us all. These are all great audiences to share your, your evaluation reporting with. Let's see. Uh, let's take one more here. Julie says, Project Advisory Board, the PI, NSF, Program Participants, yay, Industry Partners, Stakeholders in Project Ecosystem. It's really a great way to think about this is that there is an ecosystem to your project. And I mentioned that a little bit at the early part when I was talking about evaluation use. That use can occur to, uh, uh, evaluation use can occur at so many different levels around your project. And so thinking about your project as an ecosystem of all the kind of stakeholders that might be involved really does open the door to a, a lot of opportunity for sharing your evaluation results. Super. Let's move on to another story that we've obtained from one of our uh, ATE PIs. Khalid Tantawi is a ATPI, and he is a professor of mechatronics at the University of Tennessee, uh, Chattanooga. He's also, his project is the Smart Manufacturing for America's Revolutionizing Technological Transformation. And we're going to hear a little bit about uh, ways that he uses evaluation reporting. And let's hear from Khalid. My name is uh, Khalid Tantawi. Uh, I'm a professor of me mechatronics at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. I also uh, I'm a, the project uh, uh, I'm the project uh, manager and PI on the smart manufacturing for America's revolu revolutionizing technological transformation uh, project uh, by Malo State Community College. So, uh, as for the evaluation, actually, I, uh, one thing that uh, as part of this project. If you allow me to talk about the project, actually, uh, first. So this project is, uh, we have in it uh, train the trainer workshops. We have two workshops per year. So we have in each workshop, there are 20 participants that come from uh, community colleges uh, in, 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 in the state and the nearby states uh, for each workshop. So uh, one important thing that I look forward to uh, is the workshop evaluation report. So uh, actually, there are four things uh, in the evaluation report that I particularly look at. Uh, so the overall workshop experience, you know, such as, for example, let's say uh, the logistics of the of the uh, uh, for the workshop. Uh, also, uh, for example, uh, the evaluation of each uh, present uh, presentation, each speaker. So we have actually speakers from industry, uh, and uh, actually, by the way, also the industry speakers they look forward to the report. I shared it with them actually. And it's a good thing because you know the you know the report actually just like uh, an evaluation in a classroom you know uh, it includes uh, you know information that uh, uh, probably the participants would otherwise be hesitant to share uh, you know if it's not uh, you know uh, uh, anonymous. Um, another thing is also uh, if there's anything you know that they would like to be improved in future workshops. They sometimes they actually they give very good uh, you know uh, very good points actually. And uh, also, uh, um, uh, any comments, if they have any, any other comments about uh, the workshop. So, uh, yeah, 
yeah, this actually they they have been very helpful in you know improving the workshops you know uh, every time. And uh, actually, like I said, me and uh, and the the project team and also the speakers uh, look forward to you know for these uh, evaluation uh, comments and questions. And, you know, the report overall. <laughs> Thank you so much, Khalid. And, you know, what I heard uh, is that Khalid really appreciates his workshop evaluation forms because they provide insights that he might not otherwise get. And he hinted at two things that I want to highlight. One is the issue of confidentiality of workshop evaluation surveys. It is so important that both the people providing input and the evaluator or staff gathering this information respects the confidential nature of the input. People will often provide very useful input if they know they will not be put on the spot to explain or defend their input. Secondly, notice that he shares his evaluation findings with others and each then have the opportunity to learn from these data. I want to underscore how important it is to share evaluation findings with as many constituents, constituencies as possible. Of course, within reason, not everybody will find them useful or should even be provided with them. But okay, so at this point, I'd like to ask Emma to facilitate reviewing the, any questions that we've been getting in the chat window and let us try to answer some of them. Great, Michael, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we had a couple questions come in during that last segment. So the first one is from Eldon. And Eldon is asking, uh, looking for ways to help improve outreach strategies. Um, so I did do a follow up with him, um, but in terms of evaluation, um, how can we improve our outreach strategies, especially during this time where we can't do uh, paper reports and such? Well, uh, that is a really good question, and uh, I wonder if Lissa has any uh, ideas on how we can improve our outreach strategies, but I would say that the world is becoming much more comfortable with Zoom and t video conferences, and I can't tell you how many people I speak to these days are so much more comfortable with getting on a Zoom call, quote unquote, and having a conversation about uh, work or, or new topics. I, I think that it's even more, I think people seem to be even more accessible today in that kind of an outreach than maybe perhaps before. Uh, even though there are many of us talking about Zoom fatigue, it does seem to be a little bit more, people have the sense that they're a little more accessible because it is the only way to get a, to, you can't just walk into somebody's office like you used to uh, and wait for their office hours. Now you can actually just send them an email and invite them to a Zoom call. So I don't know about that, but the, uh, any other ideas, but that's one I, uh, response I have to it. Yeah, Eldon, I think that's a great question. I see your clarification in the chat window about how in the time of COVID, it's difficult to meet some of these goals, bringing groups to campus to share some of the evaluation findings. I was looking through some of the other questions, and I, I think one of the things about sharing your evaluation findings with these different audiences that we've talked about is also being intentional about what that audience wants to hear and how they want to hear it, right? So we're, we're talking about platforms, whether it's face-to-face, -face, over a phone, over a Zoom call? Is it just a slide deck? Is it just an email? But we're also talking about the content and how you're presenting the content. So if you have this large evaluation report that's 30 pages, you don't need to send all 30 pages to your college administrators or your advisory committee. Honestly, those people are probably too busy to read a full 30 page report, right? So you're looking at pulling out the most important information to those specific audience members and sharing them in ways that is digestible and meaningful to them, right? And I think that, yeah, we, we are thinking creatively about what that looks like in the time of COVID. So I know at Evaluate, we're thinking about um, breaking up data into small bits and maybe creating a graph and sharing it on social media to share some of our evaluation results back with our community or the public. We're thinking about creating one pagers that tell a specific story about maybe our webinar offerings or maybe how our coaching activities are going to our advisory committees or back to our NSF program officers. So I don't think it's a one approach fits all situation. We're really making sure that we're tailoring that story and how we're using the data specifically to those audiences. 
Well, thank you, Lisa and Michael. I think we have time for just one more question, this question break. Um, this one is from Tyra, and I know a couple other people are interested in this one as well. So I am curious as to how evaluation findings can support longevity and sustainability beyond federal funding. And Michael, you used that good example earlier, and I think that's kind of what probed this question. So maybe, Lisa, do you want to go ahead and start with this one, and then Michael can follow up? So we talk about using evaluation findings for your future endeavors a little bit more later, but um, I think not only can you use evaluation to show how effective a project was to get additional funding, say from the National Science Foundation or other funders, but to go outside of that, maybe go to different industries, to go to different groups, to go to different colleges that might be able to support the sustainability of your project after that initial grant is over. Um, I believe that is what happened in the uh, example that Michael was talking about, an evaluation could really play a role in showing the impact that that project had, right? Instead of being able to go to potential funders and saying, here are the activities that we've done over the past 15 years, they could really say, this is the impact that our project had, not only on the students that participated, but in the local community and the local economy and for those employers in that area. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I would just add that one of the key things to that particular AT center finding a, a long term partner to subsume them was the fact that they had such a an integrated evaluation framework built into their system so that they could and were often sharing their insights on a regular basis that showed that they had a very a robust system of evaluation built in. And so that it was, it was, she didn't speak so much about the actual impact that made them so valuable, but the fact that they could at least have evidence of that impact and certainly evidence of the processes that led to that. So it was really about that, that system built in. I know we're reaching the end of our, our question break segment, but I, I wanted to, Eldon in the chat said that maybe he should segment the VR games from the nanotechnology labs, those evaluations to different audiences. I'm guessing you mean different aspects of the project itself, but I just wanted to throw out there that I have heard rumblings about virtual reality evaluation findings. Um, at the American Evaluation Association, there was a session on almost like virtual reality 3D logic models. So. I think that's a, an interesting idea to think about and consider. All right, well, thank you. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I think we're gonna roll them over to the next question break. Um, so go ahead and keep those questions coming in the chat. And now I'm gonna just turn it back over to Lissa to continue us forward. Thanks, Emma. All right, so we're gonna move on to how you can use evaluation findings for project accountability. So in addition to learning, many funders require that evaluations are done for the purpose of accountability. So one way you can meet these responsibilities is to share your project activities and achievements with your advisory committee. So not all projects have advisory committees, but those that do, um, the, this, these committees are responsible for overseeing the project progress and providing guidance on future activities. So sharing your evaluation with these advisors can really help them to provide a more in-depth look at how things are going, including the progress towards milestones and larger goals. And like we said before, you know, this idea of short reports or presentations or maybe even a slide deck of the evaluative data can really help your advisors be more insightful and nuanced in their suggestions. Evaluation findings can also be included in your annual report to the National Science Foundation or other funders as it's specified in your grant. So including your evaluation findings, such as maybe acknowledging how many students you served or the extent of STEM engagement that was increased, or maybe how many students pursued, pursued a career in STEM strengthens your evaluation report. That information, they, they, your program officer really wants to see it. But your program officer also really wants to hear how your project staff is responding to that data. So beyond just reporting it, but how is your project interpreting or reacting to that evaluation data? Are you making changes to your project or are there achievements that the project is particularly proud of? So including the reaction demonstrates to NSF that the project has critically consumed that evaluation data. 
And if you're funded by the National Science Foundation, projects actually have to fill out a, an outcomes report that's due 90 days after the end of the project. So this is a short public facing summary that focuses on the achievements of the project and the impact on participants' lives. So in creating this, ensure that you're collecting evaluation findings across the life of your project so that you can write an impactful outcomes report if that's something that is required for your project. So we have one final story to share with you today from Pamela Silvers. So Pamela is an ATE principal investigator for Skilled Workers Get Jobs grants. She tells us about how her evaluation helped to spark ideas for future grants. So kind of along that sustainability idea that we were talking about earlier. So let's hear from her. Hi, I'm Pamela Silvers, and I am the principal investigator for the Skilled Workers Get Jobs grant, and I'm going to talk about how evaluation helped us move forward with our grants. In 2012, when we applied for our first grant, we were new to NSF. We had never had a federal grant at our college. I had never been involved on a federal grant. As a PI, I had done some smaller grants, but nothing major. And so we got the funding for skilled workers get jobs, recruiting women and retaining all students. One of the things our evaluator told us was to really focus on what we said we were going to do in the grant. And from the very first meeting, which was about two months after we got the grant, she also said, if you start seeing things that you want to do, don't try to do everything in this grant, but think to the future. At the end of our first year, when we did the evaluation, it was really a focus on what had we accomplished with the grant and where were we at currently. But at the end of our second year, we really had the discussion of what do you wish you could have done? What is missing and where would you go? And at that point, what we really said is we've had great success. Our goal was to recruit more women and we went from 39 to 72 women in two years. But we didn't have dissemination down and we really didn't know would this work for other people? So we had discussions and we did apply for a second grant called Skilled Workers Get Jobs 2.0 Appalachian Impact. And our goal then was could we take what we did and extend it to other colleges? We partnered with six, student, six colleges in the Appalachia region and we got a second grant and looked at what we did, how could they duplicate it and did it work for them? That was also a successful grant. And to continue to our third grant, we really again looked at what haven't we done? And we realized although we did a great job of recruiting non-traditional students, we weren't doing as great of a job with high school students. We still were not getting students to come into our programs right from high school. So we looked at why not, what might be some reasons. We did research and we wrote a third grant which was funded and the one we're currently working on called Skilled Workers Get Jobs 2.1 High School Engagement. Our evaluator helped us do two things. One, they helped us stay on track. They helped us stay focused on what did we say we were going to do? How was that working? Did we have to adapt or change? But they also helped us put items into the box for the future. What might we wanna do? And is it within the scope of our current project or should we look for a future project? So my advice, get your evaluator on board as soon as you know that you have been funded and meet with them regularly. It is not a once a year process. It is a, can I get feedback all the time on both where I'm at and where I might wanna go? Thank you. I really appreciate the question that Pamela's evaluator asked about planning for the future. They asked, what do you wish you would have done and what's missing? I also really love that Pamela sees her evaluator as part of the team, as a critical friend who's learning alongside the project team and rooting for this, their success. So now I'm gonna pass it off to Michael for our final section. Great, thanks, Lissa. Uh, this final section on project planning, as I like to think of it as planning ahead. <clears throat> so the three different pieces in here, and one of them is that we want to identify areas of need for future projects. And I think that everyone on this webinar can probably relate to the idea that what you're learning now also has usefulness beyond just where you are in this moment. Oftentimes you're on a three-year grant and a year into it, you're thinking perhaps, what are we going to do next? Or is there a spin-off project related to this one that we can find funding for? You learn something on this project and you would like to put it to use on some other project. 
Identifying areas that have need for future projects is a great use of evaluation. <clears throat> so often our evaluation findings suggest some new area of inquiry. For instance, if a project's evaluation showed that a certain type of intervention worked especially well in your local context, it may point to an opportunity to test how it works on a larger scale. Evaluate has some great resources on their site, uh, and in particular the checklist of the common guidelines for education, research, and development could be useful to help you learn more about foundation, early stage, and design and development research. And finally, every NSF grant application requires you to substantiate what you've done previously with its money. Keeping track of your reporting with an eye towards using it in the future is a great way to use your evaluation funding. So you've heard us now talk about four stages uh, or uh, as I might think of them as buckets or categories of ways to think about evaluation use. We've given you 14 different ways of thinking about it through project improvement, dissemination and advocacy, project accountability, and project planning. So now let's see which of these provides the most opportunity for you to increase the use of, your, uh, of evaluation in your context with a poll. Now let's look to the right and see what we've got. There are those four sections, and so the question is, where do you see the most opportunity to increase the use of evaluation in your context? You've heard us give you 14 different ways to think about it, uh, and hopefully there are things now that you are making plans for what you might uh, go back to your organization, maybe right after this webinar, maybe next week, uh, and, and start building more opportunities for using your evaluation use. It looks like the largest percentage of our respondents talk about project improvement, but it looks like it's now being tied with dissemination and advocacy. And then the third is project planning. Project accountability seems to be languishing down there around the 8%. Maybe that's a sign that project accountability is already kind of baked into what it is you're doing with your evaluate project, but that there are opportunities for for more uh, use of your evaluation around project improvement. It looks like it's now taken up the lead with 37% of our respondents. Uh, we appreciate that you've uh, w uh, responded to that. And I think that taking these lessons back to your, uh, to your college and your projects could be really uh, a great way to then use your evaluation more, more prominently. Uh, which is great that you've mentioned that because, uh, or that that has come up highest because we've got this handout that we created. All 14 of these ways to use evaluation findings. I see our image says 13 ways, but there is 14 actually. And we've linked it here on, this, on the right, and you should be able to see it. An easy resource to reflect on each of these. Each of them will also include some, of, some ex explanation. And the handout will be available there in that handouts win window until the end of the webinar. But let's hand it back over to Emma to see what questions have popped up in the chat that we might be able to answer. Emma? Um, so yeah, we had a couple questions come through. Um, so one was, let's go ahead and throw that up so we can all see it. How can we use storytelling and evaluation to capture feedback from beneficiaries? Hmm. Well, storytelling is really a fantastic way to get your evaluation uh, insights and findings out to audiences. There's lots of ways to think about this. One way that uh, I have done with a project about five or six years ago is that there was a lot uh, there were a lot of data collected from participants in a, in the project that told the stories of people in the project and what they experienced firsthand and then what they did is they created a fictionalized character that they described that person's participation in the project using all of the real data that they obtained from participants in the project. So they created this analog story of, you know, for instance, Martha, who went through the project from beginning to end and went out and got a job with the nanotech industry. And so they used real data to create a fictionalized character that told the story of somebody participating and benefiting with all the challenges that our students you know, have to work through. And those came in uh, to, uh, uh, and they combined them then to create a, a story about somebody uh, 
you know, uh, that they could then share with uh, potential uh, stakeholders in the program. Thank you, Michael. And uh, the last question we have here is from Tyra. Um, she's asking Lissa, just curious as to what measurements are being used to validate effectiveness. In other words, what approaches are being used to say whether a program or intervention perhaps is effective or not? Yeah, thanks, Tyra. This is a great question. I will say the answer is rather large. So to keep it a little bit um, wieldy, I guess my my answer would say that effectiveness means something different to every program, right? It, it depends on what the program is and what they're really trying to do. And so in order to really capture that, it depends on having good evaluation questions. So starting from a foundation of asking the right questions to get the right data. And when I say right data, I also mean trustworthy data. Right, and so trustworthiness can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different situations, depending on the stakeholders, depending on culturally responsiveness, and that can lead to a difference in accepted types of data and a difference in accepted designs that are used, even differences in how that data is interpreted. So I, I think that there is no one way to, to validate the effectiveness of a program. Uh, if you are interested in talking more about that, I would love to talk to you uh, further about it. So feel free to reach out to me. Or it's also a great question to ask one of our ATE evaluation coaches to talk specifically about your context and your evaluation. So if we didn't get to your question or you want to continue the conversation, uh, please join us for our upcoming web chat on December 15th. Our web chat are small group discussions around various topics, and this will be a follow-up on today's evaluation use. Um, we will have Lisa and Michael joining us along with several community members to discuss how evaluation can benefit your project. So if you have not already done so, we would encourage you to jump on our website and register for that. Also, Lissa just mentioned the ATE Evaluation Coaching Program. Um, so we are excited to announce that we have three coaches available for ATE project staff, grant specialists, and evaluators. Uh, no question is too small to chat with one of our coaches. ATE Evaluation Coaches can work with you to develop an evaluation plan, review evaluation instruments, or discuss evaluation reporting, or for example, that great question that Tyra just posed. Uh, you can schedule a meeting with a coach on Evaluate's website. And if you have additional questions about the webinar material, join us now on our Evaluate Slack community. The Evaluate team will be online for the next hour to help address additional questions or have further discussions on the topic. The Slack community is also a great place to meet new evaluation community members. So we encourage you to go to our website and join. If you have already a member, come chat with us after this webinar. And are you interested in expanding your evaluation knowledge? Well, then join our partner program, IDPEX, for a course this spring. IDPEX courses are being offered through Western Michigan University's Interdisciplinary PhD in Evaluation Program. You can take these graduate courses individually without enrollment to the PhD program at a minimal cost. Currently, we are offering three courses, measurement for evaluators, research on evaluation, and meta-evaluation for spring 2021. You can find out more about these courses through the link on the screen and also posted in the chat, or by directly contacting Michael, who is one of the associate professors of that program. So with that, that ends our webinar. We would like to thank our presenters, Lissa and Michael, and of course, all of you for coming and attending and asking such great questions today. Again, we hope to follow up with you on one of our great programs, either our Slack community, our coaching program, or through the community. So, and also please join us for our next webinar. Our full schedule will be posted soon for 2021. So with that, I hope you all have a great and safe December and have a great day. Thank you.